so which was co-authored with my uh, supervisor, Mike Osborne, uh, here at Oxford. So we call it for tall and white data because we see these Bessier Gaussian processes as a new way to scale uh, Gaussian processes to tall data, that is a lot of observations, and uh, to wide data, that is uh, many uh, input features. Um, and yeah, please feel free to interrupt uh, at any point uh, if you want to. Um, I can see you, so please just uh, yeah shout. Okay, so before we talk about Gaussian processes, we probably have to understand Bezier curves and Bezier surfaces. So some of you might have uh, heard about Bezier curves, which is kind of you know a curve. We have two endpoints, and then the order one curve is the linear interpolation of these two. And then you can introduce a, a, a third control point in the middle where you can kind of like drag a parabola uh, underneath it. Uh, so if we look at this, so that is in a, for a one dimensional input. We can scale this to something called Bezier surfaces, which we can kind of think of now we have uh, four control points in each dimension. And then if we can embed these control points in three dimensions, so now these yellow control points here um, are in three dimensions, we can kind of drag these control points and then we can drag this resulting function f uh, underneath it uh, in this kind of blue net as we have here. So this extends to more than two dimensions. So how does the grid expand in the input space? Well, it expands as a as a mesh in, in three dimensions and, of course, a mesh in four dimensions if you want to go further. So how does this look in a functional form? Well, the control points in the output space are these P's. So these are the, the yellow points here. And they are all scaled with these, which is called the Bernstein polynomials, and I'll show, show them shortly, uh, which then breaks into a product over all the dimensions. And there are one of these sums for each dimension, and they all sum up to nu, which is the order of the Bernstein polynomials. So for the Bernstein polynomials of order four, there are five uh, Bernstein polynomials, and therefore also five control points, where here there's four control points, for example. And notice here that x takes a multidimensional input uh, in d dimensions, and it then breaks out into this product here. So I hope this kind of gives you a sense of um, what Bezier surfaces is. Um, so today we are only going to consider p being of dimension one. So here they are dimension three um, because it's pretty easy to visualize. But if this is dimension one, then we are just considering regression, and this is what we're going to consider. So a Bezier Gaussian process we can then define if we let all the control points be Gaussian distributed with a mean theta and a variance uh, sigma. Um, and why is this convenient? Well, it's convenient because I can analytically compute the expectation for any f of x. Well, I take the expectation of the left-hand side of the top equation here, and then the equation, and the only random bit here is then the control point, so I move the expectation inside of the sums. So the expectation is, of course, what we said uh, was theta. So, so this is convenient because usually in Gaussian process, we have to invert matrices. But here, there is no matrix inverse. Now, of course, there's a problem that we have potentially a very big sum because, as we can see, as we saw on this slide here, if we have a high dimensional input, it's going to be a very big sum, right? There is going to be exponentially many summons. And we're going to uh, show a way of how we can kind of handle this later. So in this talk, I'm only going to talk about the mean of f. But please believe me when I say that exactly the same thing can be done for the variance of f. So if I can uh, want to compute, for example, the variance of f, then it's basically squaring all these uh, Bernstein polynomials and then replacing this by the variance. So again, if I want to compute the variance of f at any point, it's still just a big sum. There's no matrix inverses. But I'm going to keep it 
should I mean in this talk for simplicity? So I said I would kind of introduce these Bernstein polynomials because you can see uh, the resulting f we get up here is a polynomial or it's a sum of scaled polynomials. Uh, but these polynomials are not in the canonical basis, they are in these Bernstein basis, which again means that x is only defined from 0 to 1 in all dimensions, which means that we are restricted to a half a cube. In practice, we can, of course, always scale down our data to a half a cube if we have a box bounded domain. And here, kind of the, the, the Bernstein polynomial in functional form. So if, uh, for example, the Bernstein polynomials of order 20, there are uh, 21 Bernstein polynomials. And these are the basis functions over our domain. So now we're gonna talk about how, we, how we're gonna scale this. So I said, there's no matrix inverses, which is good, but there are potentially a very big sum here. So we're gonna say that each of these thetas which are the mean of the control points, is going to split out into a product that goes up to D, which is the input dimension, and it's going to be W and something here. Now, this term doesn't make a lot of sense, but we can kind of visualize it of how it is. So this is um, what we call a Bechier buttress. Now, buttress, I didn't know what, what it was, but Mike told me it's something that supports a building. So you can kind of think of this up here as something that supports our construction, this Bechier construction. And I wanna be clear that this is not a neural network. I know probably our brains are wired to see this as a, as a neural network, but it's not a neural network. Um, so what I'm saying, so consider if we have input dimension three, then we have three layers in our buttress. And if all of these layers have the order three, then all of the layers have four control points or four Bernstein polynomials, if you, if you want to keep it like that. Now, I said this is not a neural network. I rather want to call it a source and sync graph. Because now, from the source, which is the leftmost square here, to the sink, the rightmost square, there are as many paths as there are control points uh, under these configurations. So for example, the control point, which would I1 up to ID would be one, two, three, is exactly the one that I've marked in red here. And you can see these Ws then are what is on these edges, W11, and then W122, uh, two, two, and so forth. So instead of parameterizing uh, the control point means as kind of what they are, we parameterize them in this weight space, which is then visualized in this buttress here. Okay. And please, uh, if there are any questions, um, yeah, interrupt, please. Sorry, it's maybe a stupid question, and you might have just actually said it, but I was trying to get my head around what you're saying, but are there more Ws than there would be if, if you just parameterized it each bit theta individually? Are they the same number? Um, so there is less Ws, I would say. Well, so can, no, not necessarily. That depends on the configuration. Okay. Um, but notice that now we are kind of sharing parameters between these. So when it really becomes big, there should be less Ws than there are. Uh, control points actually, because we are sharing a lot of these. For example, this W here is shared between a lot of control points in the first dimension. I hope that made some kind of sense. Yeah, that was good. Thank you. All right. Um, so, why does this help us uh, with scalability? Now let's consider the bottom equation here. That is, if I want to sum over all control point means, then the first input, which I've also visualized in the buttress, is a one. 
and then let W1 here be the matrix that corresponds to this here, like you would in a neural network. Now I said it wasn't a neural network, but sometimes it's helpful to think of it as a neural network. And yes, yeah, so W1 is, is this uh, weight matrix, and W2 is this weight matrix here, and so forth. Now I'm saying that summing over all control points is basically just a forward pass in this buttress. So even though the, so there, the number of control point grows exponentially with, uh, with the input dimensions, that is adding more layers to a buttress. But in this here, it only grows linearly. So I just have to add one more matrix product uh, instead of exponentially more uh, control points. So the idea is that it now it's actually quite cheap to compute this uh, sum over many control points. So now one of the quantities of interest is of course the mean and the variance, but as I said, I'm not gonna talk about the variance um, uh, in this talk. Uh, it is in the paper, maybe somewhere. Um, so how do I compute um, this here with the Bernstein polynomials uh, scaling all of the control points? Well, instead of uh, having uh, this matrix product, I'm now going to introduce sequentially these bx1 and bxt. So I've kind of visualized it on the last layer here. That so bxd will be the diagonal matrix of size order by order, and then you will have kind of the Bernstein polynomials 0, 1, 2, 3. It's probably easier if I kind of sort it down here. So on this up here, I'm going to multiply by the beta 0 uh, Bernstein polynomial and corresponding to all of these. If I do that, then exactly the control point that, that is going through here is going to be multiplied by the correct Bernstein uh, polynomials. So again, computing the expectation of f of the f where f is now this Bessier Gaussian process is again just uh, a forward pass in this buttress. But now we have to multiply um, the Bernstein polynomials, which is again just a matrix product. Sorry, I have, I have another question. Um, so yeah, you, uh, I'm willing to believe that the, the variance is similar. Is, is the, the covariance is surely something we're interested in if we're going to define a stochastic process? Does that get even more hairy or? Um, it does get more hairy, yeah, but you can compute it. Potentially, you would need two forward passes if you have like the coordinates between two points. Um, so in this paper, we are going to make this assumption that is often made uh, that we are conditional on uh, if we assume that oral observations are independent. So we actually don't have to compute covariances. Um, but I, th I think you can compute co covariances, even matrices quite cheap, because I think they're going to be an outer product over, um, yep, over, the, over these subs. Yeah. OK, thank you. Um, yeah, so in the paper, I have uh, how the covariance looks, and um, yeah. I also have a couple of maybe a little bit naive questions. So the, the, the first one is, uh, I think, and I think you might have mentioned this already, but just to reiterate, so the number of nodes in this graph per layer, uh, how does this change with the input dimension is that how is um, how does it relate to the number of um, say input dimensions or other design parameters that we have? Yeah. So if you have, so this is for three input dimensions. So there are three layers, and if you have four input dimensions, you would have four layers. Right, and, and then the the number of nodes per layer is that is um, so. Let me show this here. So that is these numbers. So 
here you can see we have um, an order of three, which means that there are four uh, control points in this dimension. Yeah. Where here you'd have an order of one in this dimension, an order of three in this dimension, an order of three in this dimension. So you'd have a two by three, no, sorry, three by four by four uh, buttress in the in this situation. And, and then the, the so so you you could uh, sort of design another GP with uh, different numbers of uh, as you like sort of uh, uh, different different yes. discrete deviation size. Yes, this is basically choosing these numbers new, and this results in what is kind of the order of the polynomial in that dimension. So if I had more uh, a higher order, I could of course make a more whippy function. If I had an order of one, it would be a linear interpolation. And sorry, does the does the number of control points just control the like expressivity of the GP? Yes. So as I said, I mean it, it, it is a polynomial GP that we're considering here, but it's not a, the the canonical uh, polynomial is in this Bernstein basis. And I'm going to show that it has some more attractive uh, properties than the canonical basis. And then another quick question was, uh, so we've defined a GP prior, right, by specifying a, a mean and a, and, and, and a variance, right? So, uh, and you said there's sort of no matrix inverses required for this bit, right, but we'll eventually need to fit it, right? Yes, so I haven't talked about priors and posteriors yet. Um, now I've just defined how you can define a, a Gaussian process. Right. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to talk about priors and posteriors in, in just a bit. Cool. So yeah, for any um, GP of this form, I can compute uh, the mean of it and the variance of it, as long as I know the, the mean of the control points and variance of the control points. OK. Um, so this was the last slide that we got to before this small interruption. Um, um, all right, so now let's talk a bit about priors. This is convenient. So, of course, when we talk about priors uh, of a Gaussian process, now this Gaussian process is completely determined by the control points. So if I want to specify a prior over the Gaussian process, I have to specify a prior over the control points. So of course, the naive thing to do would to be to say, okay, they're all independent, and we aren't going to be that naive. But if I say that they're all unit Gaussian, for example, then my prior is going to look like this because of the nature of the Bernstein polynomials. Now, the good thing is that I can kind of adjust for this because I would like uh, a prior that looks like this. I mean, this is what we're used to seeing uh, our priors look like. So I can say that for each dimension, I'm gonna solve a linear system such that the squared Bernstein polynomials, which of course is associated with the variance, I'm gonna find the values for the control point means such that the variance around all the control points along this path here. So imagine there are like control points equispaced along this line. And I'm going to solve this such that it's equal to one everywhere. And I can do this by simply matrix inverting uh, this uh, Bernstein um, polynomial squared matrix. Um, so it's basically solving a, a, let's say, 10 by 10 if my uh, polynomial has have order nine. So it's also very cheap and it only has to be done once. That's a good you, thing now. I, I, I'm sorry, could you have kind of just chop, just use the middle bit? Or is that quite naive? Yeah. Yeah, I, I can use it. Uh, there's no problem. It's going to be a problem though if we now have only visualized it for a 1D input. But imagine that, so along this axis, it, it looks like this, but it also looks like this along this axis. And these two axes are kind of multiplied with each other. So also the variance is going to be even smaller when I go up to two dimensions. So yeah, it's going to be a very, very, very narrow prior in the very central region. And this is going to be even more narrow as I move up in higher dimensions. 
So I do think that it is actually very convenient that we can do this uh, adjustment. Now I do this adjustment in, in all dimensions, and then it's of course one uh, times one is one, so it's gonna it's gonna stay there. But I mean, so in one dimension, this is not a terrible prior, but knowing that it that is a product of two of these in two dimensions makes the, the very central bit of this, what is then gonna be a square, very narrow. So now I've kind of explained how I would uh, choose my prior over these control points, such that it looks like something that we used to. This is kind of what the RBF and Matern kernels uh, give us back. So now we can talk about posteriors. Well, not really, because I'm going to talk about variational inference in a bit, and we're going to infer our posterior by variational infer inference. Um, so yeah, of course, defining a variational distribution over all these control points. But let's just look at some of the kind of how we should think about uh, the prior and control uh, points. So here I've kind of given us some data uh, of these observations, and I've intentionally left out the middle section such that there's no data here. And this is kind of visualized that for the Bernstein basis, we can actually uh, extrapolate uh, variances. And of course, this is gonna be because the KL term of the control points in here is gonna drag it towards the prior. And this is exactly what we see if we look at the control points. So if we look at the prior control points, these are kind of the orange points here, we can see that this trick that we did just before by scaling some of them such that the resulting F has variance one, this is why they don't have the same variance, all of them. And the variance in here is larger because we wanted to expand the, the variance of F in this region. So what we exactly see is that now also notice please that the scale of the y-axis here is quite different. So we can see that in the posterior, we're kind of dragging our the first section on the left-hand side, we're kind of dragging that upwards to of course go through the data points. But then in the region where we don't have any data points, we can kind of see that the posterior control points and the prior control points are gonna align. This is why we're gonna see this tendency to go towards zero and expand the variance. And here on the right hand side, I've uh, plotted the posterior variance. And we can indeed see that in this region of no data, we have the, the highest variance. So even though it's polynomial GP, we still can actually get kind of these uh, results that away from data, we have extrapolating variances. And this is a very uh, important feature to have for whenever you want to do some kind of active learning that uh, is based on the exploitation and exploration trade-off. All right, now to the bit more dense bit, because now we're gonna do variational inference. Um, uh, I, have a, I have a slightly stupid question. Where does the kernel choice come into all of this? The kernel choice? Yeah. So where have you so, chosen a specific kernel which is doing a particular type of smoothing? So my kernel is, um, I think I have it. I have the paper here. So the kernel is exactly defined uh, as the variance where you would define it. So right. So the kernel is the covariance between fx and fz, and that is exactly all these uh, Bernstein polynomials. So it's like so if these were not Bernstein polynomials, but kind of the usual uh, canonical polynomial is the same, but now it's the Bernstein polynomials instead of the polynomial kernel. I see, I see, yeah, yeah, no, it makes sense. All right, that's good. So yeah, the kernel choice is a polynomial kernel in the Bernstein basis. Um, all right, so I've already talked about how we set the prior over all the control points. We're gonna assume that they're independent 
and they have a mean of zero. And the variance is chosen as this uh, adjustment that we did so that the resulting variance over F would be approximately one over the over the hive cube over our domain. Now we want to do variational inference to infer the posterior of the control points. And when we infer the posterior of the control points, we also infer the posterior over F. So yeah, this is kind of the usual apply instance inequality. And then we see that, okay, in the end, we get this expectation over our variational uh, distribution of P. And then, uh, yeah, the variational expectation. And then we have this KL term. All right. So let's initially look at the, at the first term, the variational like likelihood. Um, so we're going to assume that the likelihood uh, on our observation is Gaussian with a, with a Gaussian noise uh, sigma squared. Um, and then this term here is, I'm pretty sure, waiting for a second line, you should all be familiar with this term. Um, yeah, the variational expectation. So notice that we have to compute the mean of f and the variance of f uh, for all xj's for observations j1 up to n. And here again, I've assumed that when we condition on p, then all our observation breaks uh, are uh, independent. This is why they sum this so nicely. Now, what is convenient is that this expectation here, I can compute that if I simply put in the posterior mean here. So now I kind of have a fixed mean for all these. So it's going to be zero for the mean. But for the variance, I want to learn these uh, theta i up to i d, which effectively means that I want to learn this w1 up to w d in my Bezier buttress, which we can kind of see here. So we can kind of think of the Bezier buttress as doing amortized inference. So we're going to infer w rather than inferring the actual control point means. And uh, as I said, I'm not going to say how we do it for the variance, but it's going to be exactly the same. And again, there's no matrix inverses. This no matrix inverse, and here no matrix inverse. But so in the KL, now this gets quite nasty. Again, we have this very large sum. But because we've assumed independence of all our control points, both in the variational approximation and in the, in the mean, we split it out into this large sum. And I'm not going to say how exactly these are computed. Well, it's not difficult, but it's not easy either. What it is, it is, it is very, very boring to look at. So <laughs> you can kind of see this term here, which is theta squared. You can see, okay, I could just square all my uh, all my Ws, well, entry-wise at least, and then I can sum over all uh, these squares. And in the appendix, I, uh, I show how we can, in all of these, all of these terms are just one forward pass in the Bessier buttress. So even for the KL, I don't have to invert any matrix, and I don't have to compute determinants or anything. And this is really convenient. Um, so, can course, you just, so you said, okay, you're assuming variation approximations all depend dependent, and the, the mean is, it seems weird that you can, well, it seems bad. I, like it would be very coarse approximation for a KL between two things if you, if everything is independent. Like I'm surprised um, away with not taking, but I think maybe I think maybe I'm misunderstanding something. So so it's all the control points that I assume are independent, and I agree this is a very coarse uh, assumption. But so going to do this assumption such that I can I can make these computations. But I agree for for a real. So there are some covariance would. terms in this. Uh, no. 
So all of these P's are in one dimension, right? And I assume that they're all independent of each other. So there would be no covariance terms. Okay. Now, remember, there's no, there, maybe you're thinking of covariance between X's, between observations, but I'm talking about a covariance between control points. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. So this is like in the normal SVGP, it'd be just, it's the KL between the inducing points. Right, so it's yes. standard. It's like um, an approximation in there, not, okay. Right. Yes, I think, it's not, I think it makes sense. It's not, uh, it's not silly to think of the control points as inducing points, but of course, in the inducing framework, you have this benefit. You can also, you can actually make them correlated, um, which I don't know how I would do that in, in this framework. The good thing is that I can add a lot of them. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah, that does make sense. Thank you. Okay, so yeah. Uh, basically, Computing KL is just, again, one forward pass in the best shape buttress. But you do have to make some algebraic manipulations somewhere. But I'm gonna, yeah, not show them to you because they're very boring. Um, all right, so this kind of leads us on to some results. And here is kind of the, so these are, of course, the results from the paper. Um, but we do it on this UCI benchmark. And here we compare against the STPR and the simplex GP, which is uh, it came out from Andrew Gordon Wilson's group. And they kind of had this, uh, they said that it also kind of expanded nicely in the, in the number of input features. Um, I did have a very tough time making it work for the log likelihood, but for the RMSC, it kind of sometimes did much better and sometimes not. Um, so I think the, I think the SGPR is, is the fairest com comparison here. Now I did it for both M equal to 100 and M equal to 500. And for the Bechier, I said, okay, let all input dimensions have either order five, order 10 or order 20. Um, what you might notice is that there are some freaky results for the Bechier. Uh, for example, down here, we have an RMSC of 7 to the power of E11. <laughs> and that is because in one of the, so I did the, this over 20 splits. That's where the kind of the variance uh, standard deviation is. So for one of these splits, one of the test points was outside of the Hager cube. And uh, I don't provide any guarantees for points that are outside the Hager cube. So in the rebuttal for, for Neuros, we also um, did report a result if we would have used another scaling. So I scaled my data such that all the training data would be inside the happy cube. There's of course a failure mode that there could be test points then outside. So this is uh, a freak result here and I think also a freak result here. Um, and then another thing we observe is that, for example, on Boston, we have a tendency of overfitting, which is not weird because we have data points in 13 dimensions and we have only uh, 500 data points. And then we're gonna model it with a, a polynomial of order 20 in each of these dimensions. And that is of course a lot of wiggle room for, for, uh, for only 500 data points. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna get back to, um, to why and how we can solve this problem. Uh, or, uh, yeah, I'm gonna say that we have to solve this problem, not how, yes, not sure yet. Um, so uh, the promise of the paper was of course that it scales to tall and wide data. So we also tested it out on some bigger data sets. For example, here we have 1.3 million observations. Um, and the competitors here are SVGP and SGPR and then the simplex and exact GP, which also comes out of Wilson's group. Um, and on the first data here, we uh, took the results from uh, this deep GP paper from Sally Bainey and Dyson Roth. 
uh, yeah, stochastic variational inference uh, paper. And we can see actually the Bechier in RMSC is doing almost as well as the three layer uh, deep Gaussian process. And this is for input dimension uh, 90. Um, and then we have one result over here on dimension 385, where we can see that in RMSC, we are actually doing quite well. But we also noticed that we are here using an order of three. And we kind of have the same problem on this data set as we did on Boston, because 35,000 observations in this very big space is not a lot of observations. In, uh, so if we compute the n by d ratio is around 10. So trying to do it with a with an order 20 GP, uh, you're going to see your fitting uh, as a problem again. Um, yeah, so this is why we reported it for, for 3 and 5, because the order 20 would be much worse. Um, yeah, so we can actually compute these in quite high dimensions uh, and also for uh, large n. So, yeah, so I'm going to not stop here because I want to uh, say how we can actually use this GP and what are kind of the, the next step for Bechet Gaussian processes. But so just to summarize, we've introduced this framework because it scales in the number of observations and in the number of features. Uh, so it scales in the number of observations because we don't have to compute these inverses uh, and we don't have to compute matrix determinants. But for the number of features, we say that it scales well because we are able to control this exponential growth of control points. So think of the hypercube, we can really make a fine mesh inside the hypercube of a lot of points, but we only have this linear penalty in the Bessier buttress. Um, and then we kind of also showed that we can, in this kernel choice of the Bernstein polynomials, it can kind of behave like the typical kernels. And when I say typical kernel, I mean the RBF kernel and the Matern kernel as such. Because we see extrapolating uh, variances, and we saw that the prior can be amended to, to behave like the, the RBF prior. Now, one thing I could hint at is, could there be other basis functions that we could use in the Bechet buttress? For example, what if we use the the RBF basis functions, which are kind of these bell curves uh, around each point. Could we actually make all the computations in the Bechet buttress? It, of course, would make it a different GP, but it could make it uh, smoother uh, in some sense than the, than the Bernstein polynomials. Uh, this was just a thought. Maybe you can think more about it. Uh, I would love to hear what you, uh, what you think. But so. Ending this talk, I, would, I think I would say, I would again show you this uh, slice data set. Now, I said that we show it for beta, oh, I sorry, new, the order uh, three and uh, order of five. And if we had used order 20, it would be much worse. Now, it's not surprising now that if I add more order to each dimension, I'm going to be able to fit this better because yeah, I can just overfit my training data. Uh, really easy. But there's also a tendency that the kale is going to be a very dominating term. Um, because I mean, we, I'm, I'm, I'm summing over so many kale terms, so that it's very likely that I'm going to learn the prior. So in the future, I think that we should all also be able to infer the orders of each of these dimensions. Now, of course, these are integer values, so I can't really learn them through gradient descent or something. But given that the elbow is my um, is my objective function, could I just kind of try out uh, over some grid different values and then choose whatever has the highest elbow as my uh, as my best solution? Would would that kind of trade off a penalty in, in KL and Variational expectation. That is my hope, at least, and it's something that I'm going to investigate because I've been. So, in this paper, I just said 5, 10, and 20 for all my experiments. 
and it, it worked okay, but I think we can push performance even better by actually choosing these uh, orders based on the data. And as Henry said, I'm also kind of interested in Bayesian quadrature. And the idea for this paper actually came uh, out of my interest in Bayesian quadrature. Because these Bessier Gaussian processes, now if it's a Bessier Gaussian process, I can try and integrate it. So the expectation of IFF then becomes this here. And if I know that all these Bernstein polynomials in all dimensions are uh, analytically tractable, then in the end, it's basically pushing the expectation inside again and then integrating all the Bernsteins. Then I have that the expectation over my integral is just, again, a sum over the expectation of all my control points. So I'm also investigating if we can use this to kind of scale Bessier quadrature to, to higher dimensional uh, domains than we are currently able to. And I think this is where I want to terminate uh, my presentation. And of course, happy to discuss further and hear your thoughts about this. Yeah, thank you very much, Martin. So, yeah, I, I, have, I have a couple of questions. Um, yeah, that was a great talk. I think it's really, like, it's quite quite a challenging material, but I think you made it reasonably clear. Um, I wonder, you see, so you have this overfitting issue. Does that have anything to do with the fact that you've assumed a factorizable prior over the um, the points? I, I think so, yes. Because um, I think if you, did this, if you did this in SVGP world, you might get, you might, like, over the inducing points, would, would that encourage overfitting? There'd be kind of less regularization on the on what the variational parameters end up being, I think. Yes, uh, yeah, I, I agree. So this is why I think it's also important that we are able to infer how many control points do we actually need. Because if I just like headlessly add more control points, then I'm just adding more regularis regularization to my to my model. And this is not really what I want. I want to find the the correct level of regularization. Um, such that the model kind of makes sense. I mean, so we have this uh, experiment here, right, in 385 dimensions. And I don't believe that all 385 dimensions are important. So it could be that for some of the dimensions, the, the correct order to, to choose would be the order of zero, which would just give you a constant along that uh, dimension. And then we can kind of find out which of the dimensions are actually important to, to model. Um, but yeah, I, I, I agree that assuming they're all independent also kind of only pumps up this KL term, right? So the KL would probably be, be smaller if I didn't assume that the control points were independent. Yeah, I think that makes sense. My other question was that you said that you might try and use the elbow to determine the news. I I worry that might be a bit dangerous. I know that that's not necessarily a good idea, for example, with an SVGP, if you want to tune the number of inducing points. Is that right, Artem? If you use the elbow to choose the number of inducing points, that's not a thing you should do. Well, um, it's slightly different context than thing, right? So here, uh, and, and as, as DPR, it's fine. If you would have a, something like a gap, like upper and lower bounds, then it's fine. So you can... If you have a quantity of M inducing points that depends on your elbow, then it's okay. You, you can do this. Okay. Um, but I'm not sure that you can do it here, to be fair. Like it's, it's a slightly different relation. Yeah, I think it is a bit, bit different here because here the number of new kind of determines how weakly your function can be. Where, I mean, adding. Yeah. So, yeah. Am, am I right? Am I right that the, the, the logic here is that you're kind of trying to determine which uh, dimension has support points and and like a proper support points and the, which dimension actually is uh, uh, just collab like collapsed support points or something like that, right? Yeah. So, um, this is something that that I would love to be able to uh, detect from the data. So yeah. 
So I, mean, I think this as a, as a model selection, it is kind of, can I identify the correct polynomial to use uh, on this data? Okay, I think I was thinking about it wrong. So this is more like, you know, this is more similar to like tuning the kernel than it is to yeah. tuning the modeling capacity. Yes. Okay, got yeah, it. You, you kind of can think like that the, the length scale in one dimension is just like huge and or another scale is proper. Uh, you kind of turning on and off, like here it's more like ARD analog of your kernel and it's never been saying, I would not would think about this that way. Yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. That's cool. Um, I actually, sorry, I do have one more very quick. Uh, in terms of the like actual runtime of this, presumably this was an absolute nightmare to code up. Um, but in terms of like, if I was going to run this versus, uh, you know, in your experimental results, is this of a similar cost to like an SVGP or an FGPR? Or sorry, can can I rephrase? So I had a question like about the complexity. Like in the end, what's the complexity of your algorithm basically? Um, so it scales linearly in the number of observations and in the number of input dimensions. So one thing is that we have increasing penalty in more input dimensions, which we don't have, for example, in SGPR and SVGP. Um, but we only have a linear uh, penalty in, um, in the number of observations, not even squared. So it's squared in the number of uh, control points in each dimension. Let me see. I think I write it somewhere. Yes. So this here should be the final complexity. So here, uh, I didn't go into what R is in my presentation here, but you can read this section. So now let me say what it is. So when I use the Bezier buttress, right, then it, the matrix uh, multiplication is not commutative, right? This is what I say. So this implies that the ordering of my matrices, so this means that my ordering of the input dimensions is actually also important. So we solve this by basically having uh, R uh, Bessier buttresses so that our F is now a sum of R uh, Gaussian processes. But now in each Bessier buttress, they have a uh, uh, a pure commuted order, so we kind of yeah marginalize uh, matrix commutativity. So this is what R is. So the more kind of parallel Bezier buttress we have, we have a penalty there. Then we have a penalty in how many layers each Bezier buttress have, and then of course when we have to compute these uh, matrix products, they have complexity uh, new squared. No, but but the, if you do the matrix matrix product, so the matrix product itself is a cubic operation, right? So in um, yeah. what's what's the cost in the end? Like it's a n what like n n m, or it will depend on your no. number of four points and so, so on and so forth. Remember, the matrix products are only over the control points. Uh huh. Right. So it's only for this here be uh, four squared complexity, right? So I have for one data point, I can put it through here, but then I have to do that, you know, n times. For each data point, I have to make a forward pass because the data point comes in on these here. Okay. But the, the matrix multiplication happens over here. There's no matrix multiplication involved with the observations. Right. And, and how many how many usually would you like in practice you would need this uh, like let's call it number of hidden units <laughs> it's not a thing on effort like per, per layer yeah so so these are of course no 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 so I mean so in the results right I did it for five ten and twenty. So how many there is in one layer is exactly the order that I choose. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, and maybe another relation, uh, another question in relation to the complexity. So you're doing variational inference and you had an, uh, an expression for the elbow, which includes a Q over P, which are the control points, right? 
Um, and I was wondering, does do you actually, since there are like exponentially many control, is, that, is it right that it's exponentially many control points with the input dimension, right? Yes. Uh, so are you actually maintaining Q over P? Like Q over P seems like a distribution which is, well, over an exponentially, you know, dimensional space, if you like. Um, so how, how yeah, do you avoid it? Yeah, remember that I said that also actually we don't do the inference over uh, the P's directly. We do this amortized inference over the W. So in this W, right, we have a lot of parameter sharing going on. So when I go to these, uh, for example, high input domains or a many number of features, there's going to happen a lot of uh, parameter sharing. So I'm not right. inferring exponentially many um, control points, which this sum here would be. I'm only inferring these weights of what well, is not a neural network, but it could be seen as a neural network. Right. Yes. Thank you. I think so. If some of you have heard about tensor trains, this is kind of the same thing. And now I'm talking too much because I uh, I didn't really know about tensor trains before someone told me that this looks like a tensor train. So. Um, thanks, Martin. Does anyone have, have any more questions? I mean, like, can you elaborate a bit on the tensor trains? So this is equivalent to tensor. What's a, what's a, what's a tensor train? Okay. I think. In, yeah. Uh, I should be careful what I say, but I think in tensor trains, they are also interested in kind of these quantities. They want to sum over something that is indexed by a lot of uh, stuff. So here we have an index that has D component, right? And then they do this kind of the same trick as I did with uh, the assumption here. I'm going to say that the parameters that I'm interested in, they're going to uh, factorize over D in some kind of weight space. And then they yeah compute sums and different quantities by doing these constructions. I'm afraid to say more than that because I don't know uh, more. Well, do we have any questions um, remote remotely? I guess not. I guess yeah. We'll say thanks again. Yeah, thank you so much, Martin. That was an excellent excellent talk. Yeah, thank you very much for, for listening. Uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm at NeurIPS presenting this paper if anyone is keen on knowing more. <laughs> Great. All right. Thank you. Thanks very much.